Uh, welcome everyone. My name's uh, Jan MacArthur from Department of Educational Research, and it's my very great delight to be uh, chairing this EDRES seminar today with uh, Dr. Sharon Clarence, who's a research associate at Rhodes University in South Africa. Um, I'll tell you a little bit more about Sharon in a moment, but just a few uh, housekeeping matters. Uh, once the seminar begins, can I please ask everyone to uh, turn off your camera and mute and we'll, we'll, Sharon, Sharon will then share her screen. Um, there's opportunities in the chat to ask questions, which I'll uh, look at when we get to that point. Sharon's going to talk for about 50 minutes and then we'll have a nice discussion. Uh, you can either ask your questions through the chat or just through um, popping, your, popping your hand up or, or just shouting into an empty space, whatever seems to work. We're quite informal here. Um, anything else I have to tell you? Please note that this um, is being live streamed, which I think you will realize because that's how you've joined, but that this will also be recorded um, during the presentation. The presentation will be recorded and it will be available later on the EdRes YouTube site, I believe. And I'll be correct that if I've got the wrong place there. So anyway, welcome everyone. Back to Sharon. Um, I first met Sharon many years ago at a small conference in Cape Town. And I was just struck by this incredibly friendly and collegial person who, who I didn't know anything about, but um, she just made such an impression on me that I then went away and started to read her work um, and, and, and shared with her this strong commitment to transformation and socially just higher education. Sharon's particular specialism is about supervision and academic writing. But, but this is very much positioned in a very broad social justice context. She also writes a fantastic blog that if you haven't looked at, I would strongly suggest you do, which brilliantly shows her academic generosity, not only sharing academic ideas, but just sharing the realities of academic life, which can be pretty tough sometimes and other times it's got lovely highlights. Um, she's also just produced her first book, which I, I hope she will be talking about today. So um, there's a lot, interest, a lot of interesting things in her work, and I think you'll be really pleased to, to get to know more about it today. So with that, I'll pass over to Sharon, and then I'll come back later for the discussion. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Jane, for that intro, and thank you all very much for being here. Um, thank you very much uh, to Kang Mi as well for inviting me to speak with you all today. Um, I'm assuming my audio is okay. You can all hear me. Yes, yes fine. Okay, cool. Good. Like, I had a problem on Zoom this morning, so I'm just double checking that it's all working now. <laughs> um, so I'd like to um, use this opportunity to talk to you all today about some of my work and my thinking on the meanings of access and success in higher education and how we can create the conditions for more students to turn access into their own meaningful success. So I, what I am going to be talking about today does come from my recent book, which Jan mentioned, um, Turning Access into Success, Improving University Education with Legitimation Code Theory, which has just been published by Rutledge. And it draws very much on my own teaching and academic staff development practice and research over the last decade. So my plan, if it will let me change the slide. My plan then for the next, it's just over 45 minutes, will be to set out what I think socially just education is or what it could be. A bit of background um, about higher education more broadly, but particularly South Africa, because this is where I'm located and where my field work has been done. But there are a lot of similarities between my context and the UK context and other contexts like the United States, Australia, um, other parts of uh, Southeast Asia, for example. And then I want to zoom in on one tool from legitimation code theory that we can use to improve or transform education through looking afresh at curriculum and at what we communicate to students about what counts and about who counts. And hopefully we can begin to rethink this where we need to. And then obviously I'm hoping we can have a discussion where we will connect some of my examples and some of this theory to the problems and context that you might be working on and in. And we can think a bit more about how we can improve students' chances for success in higher education together. 
So to begin, we always need to start with context because context is key. So the starting point for me in doing this research and in writing this book was that there are problems, quite obvious problems, I think, um, for anybody who spent any time in higher education over the last 10, 20, 30 years, there are problems with widening success. Certainly, this is a big issue in South Africa, but it's also an issue in the US, in the UK, in Europe, in Asia. It takes different forms in these different contexts, but this is a shared problem that we're all working on different aspects of around the world. And these have to do, at least in part, with how curriculum is designed, with how teaching is constructed and enacted, and with how we conceive of the role and practice of assessment and evaluation. So we have to ask then, of course, what is the nature of this problem? But then, um, much more challenging, what can I or we do about this so that it isn't a problem anymore? So the problem that I've been focused on and that I'm thinking uh, about in the book is um, student success, but more specifically, the skewed nature of student success in South Africa, but not only here. So research conducted in South Africa by the Council on Higher Education, and I suppose the UK uh, equivalent would maybe be Advanced HE, the Higher Education Academy, um, and other research organizations in South Africa um, show, uh, to do with higher education show us that we've come quite a long way since 1994. And we use 1994, for anybody who knows anything about South Africa, as um, our sort of before and after point, because 1994 is when we became a democracy. Yesterday, in fact, was the um, anniversary of uh, the democratic elections in 1994, Freedom Day. And um, at that point, Black students were finally allowed access to all forms of further and higher education and also basic education, which for many of them had been out of reach for a long time due to apartheid policies and laws. So for the first time, all of the universities in this country, and at that point there were 30, 34, 36, I think, we currently now have 26. Um, so they had mixed cohorts of students from a range of backgrounds. And without going into heaps of details, which I don't have time for, unfortunately, this expansion led to a lot of new work and research in the field of academic development around teaching and learning, but also around academic literacies and what was needed for students to succeed, especially working class and poor black students who had been excluded from university education. Um, well, they hadn't been completely excluded, but they'd been largely excluded from all of the universities. They'd been particular universities specifically created by the apartheid government and specific schools created by the apartheid government for black students. And they were often in rural areas, they were in the former homelands, and they really provided education that was at a vastly inferior standard to the education that white students um, got access to. So we have this very complex um, legacy in this country that really does shape in a very real way how higher education works and what access and success look like. So this, all these changes in 94 and, and then since the um, other processes that have happened in the early 2000s around different university mergers and changes to the um, institutional differentiation in our, in our context have led to um, a set of issues that the university has had to come to terms with around the knowledges in the curriculum, around what is valued in teaching and assessment and around who is valued as a legitimate or successful graduate. And this is a reckoning that is still happening and I think probably will be happening for quite some time to come. So there's been rich research on deficit discourses and how to mitigate these, on teaching and assessment practices, on academic literacy and writing development, um, on higher education policy, on governance, on curriculum development. But what all this rich research is still troubled about, not just here, but in other contexts as well, is the issue of how to turn wider participation, more equitable access into wider and more equitable success. The most recent data we have access to in South Africa shows us that black students are still less likely to graduate within the minimum time than their white counterparts, which for an undergraduate degree is three or four years and that we're losing almost 50% of each cohort of undergraduate students for a range of reasons, including personal, financial, and academic ones. 
So now we as lecturers and academic developers may not actually be able to solve students' financial and personal problems, but we can certainly do something about the academic reasons for skewed success and for skewed graduation data. That shows us that working class students, black students, and in some fields also women students are not achieving the success that they deserve at the same rates as middle class students, white students, and men students. And if we were to factor into the students living with disabilities, both invisible and visible, and perhaps also LGBTQ plus students, we may find the situation skewed even further. So we have a context where staff and student bodies of universities are now very much more diverse than they were 30 years ago. And this diversity cuts along different intersections of race, race, gender, socioeconomic background and status, disability, sexuality, educational background. You may be able to think of other intersections that I haven't thought of here. So this diversity has come about through a process of massification, which is essentially a process of opening admissions to all eligible students in the population, which has led to a greater democratization of access to higher education, but it's also led to much larger classes, strains on existing resources, and clashes between universities and their student bodies over fees, over living conditions on campus, over pastoral support, and over the academic project, including the curriculum teaching and assessment. So I'm thinking here of the student protests and the rise of what has been termed the hashtag movements, which are not just a South African thing, they're elsewhere as well. But particularly um, in our context, hashtag roads must fall and hashtag fees must fall, which came out of the initial roads must fall movement in 2015 and 2016. This is a long history of protest in South Africa. Going back to apartheid, uh, which was largely led by Black South Africans challenging their exclusions from education, from work, from safe housing, from free association, from government, and so on. And the student protests of 2015 and 2016 especially, but also before and since, and we've had protests again this year in 2021 as well, are part of this overarching culture of taking powerful bodies or structures to task for their exclusion and marginalization of Black people and working class people and of their hopes for crafting their own more purposeful and meaningful lives. Specifically, and what I want to zoom in on today, in addition to fee-free education and financial support, which is a very big issue in this country, students have been protesting on the continued centering of Western epistemology knowledges and also ways of being a recognized knower in the university curriculum. And while there are, of course, individual lecturers and courses of study, that are confronting this challenge and responding to it, the university as a whole has a great deal of reckoning ahead around issues of transformation and decolonization of knowledge, of governance, and of teaching assessment and evaluation. So this cannot be a solo or an individual project, and it's not a quick fix type project either. I argue in the book that to do this work, we need a way of theorizing education and of looking at this problem that can capture all of its dimensions rather than some over others. So we need, in other words, a kind of both and rather than an either or approach. And we need to resist oversimplification, quick fixes and shying away from complexity. But before I talk about legitimation co-theory and how it can offer us this way of working, I want to pause a little bit on the issue of justice because for me, and for many others, at its heart, what students are asking for in their protests is justice. For years under colonialism and then under apartheid, their ancestors were denied equal access, and more importantly, the means to participate in ways that could ensure equitable success. So I'm using the terms access and success here the way Wally Morrow um, uses them. I'm citing his 2015 book, Bounds of Democracy, but Wally actually came up with these um, definitions of access and success in um, the 1990s. So access he considers in two ways, formal access and epistemological access. Now, formal access is kind of what it sounds like. You apply to university, they admit you, you pay your fees and you're in, you have access. You can go to the library, you can go onto the sports fields, you can go to the rec facilities, you can go to class, you can talk to your lecturers, you can go to tutorials, you can access the computer labs, the printers, everything. You've got access to everything that your fees pay for. But Morrow argues that given the diversity of our student cohorts, especially 
in regards to the educational backgrounds and the resources many have had access to or not have, have not had access to in preparing to come to university. Formal access may ensure wider participation in a narrower sense, but not in a deeper sense in the sense of wider success. He argues for wider success, we need epistemological access. And this is, as he terms it, access to the knowledge that the university distributes. So I argue in the book that to achieve success, students need access to the knowledges that the universities create, legitimate and distribute. And they need further to have me access to the means to make sense of, use and also critique this knowledge. So success, to paraphrase Jenny Case, can be understood as the ability to use higher education to transform yourself and your life project through what she has called an intense engagement with yourself, with others, and with disciplinary knowledge. So enabling success, and the enlargement of student agency, which is their ability to grow and act and learn in personally and socially transformative ways, is at the heart of university education. This success cannot just be the expectation or reality for the elite or for the relatively few who've already had access to well-resourced schools, educated parents and family members, libraries and computers. It has to become a reality for all students who are granted formal access to university spaces. So this kind of is how I've been thinking about social justice in my work so far and in the book, as consciously looking at, thinking about, challenging what is done and has always been done to find the gaps, silences, exclusions, omissions, and begin to rectify these or address these. But I think a crucial part of this work is using critical social theory to think with, because common sense knowledge and theories that overemphasize individualistic or technicist solutions are really just not going to cut it. Critical social theories are what we need because they enable us to look at both the social and socializing dimensions and effects of education and practices. And they enable us to see individuals and organizations like universities as part of these larger social and socializing structures rather than as separate from them. So I argue that what we need is a view of higher education as both a project for individuals to transform themselves and their lives through engaging with the academic project with others with themselves and as a social project with personal, communal, and economic goals or ends. Achieving personal and professional success is hard work, right? And we do all need to put in that work to achieve success. We can't just sort of arrive at university and then just be successful. We have to work at it. But if we leave it here, and if we see success or failure in terms of an individual student's levels of motivation or desire to succeed, that's really problematic precisely because of the diversity and the history that I've already mentioned. You know, in a system, in any system, and the UK is one of them, South Africa is one of them, Australia is another one, the United States is another one, in any system marked by institutionalized legislated inequalities and exclusions, which for many years reserved success and riches for the few and left the many to fend for themselves, success is an ambivalent concept. Some individuals do succeed in spite of great odds. You know, we have, um, I don't know if you've heard the concept, we have this concept in South Africa, poverty porn, where you hold up students who come from townships and you say, look, this person got a medical degree and he came from poverty and he came from nothing. And, and while it's wonderful to celebrate that amazing success, the flip side of that is that all the black students who are not getting medical degrees and being amazing and succeeding then feel like failures. And it then becomes about this, like, well, this individual worked really hard and he made it, so what's wrong with you? And that's kind of what I'm talking about here is that this idea that because some individuals succeed in spite of immense odds does not mean that the rest of them just aren't working hard enough. Um, hard work in unequal systems, whether we're talking about race or gender or class or something else or a combination of two or more of these kinds of things, doesn't get rewarded equally. If I'm white, and I am, <laughs> my hard work will get rewarded differently than the same or maybe even more hard work than a black person if we are talking about a system um, marked by racialized inequalities and exclusions. But if I'm a woman, then maybe actually that work will be rewarded more than a black person but less than a man, right? Maybe even 
my hard work will be rewarded than less hard work than a man does, which we can see in a lot of the research on the gender pay gap. So what then if I'm a queer woman or a woman with a disability or a working class woman, what if I'm some or more of these intersections of something, you know? So is it just, must I just try harder? Or is there something about the system itself that's making other people's hard work more valuable and more legitimate than my hard work. So in essence, we can argue that while we do need as individuals to engage and work and commit ourselves to this project of enabling our own success, we are unlikely to shift and transform society on any larger scale, unless these inequitable systems that reward these efforts also change and become less biased and less unjust. So in capitalist systems especially, and I go into this in more detail in the book and I don't really have time to go into it now, um, but we can talk about it afterwards if you want to. There's, I think there's a significant disconnect between social and economic systems that create and distribute the means for achieving success and the goals and hopes of the individuals who come into that system promised that the results of their hard work will be a better life. And of course we know because we have reams and reams and reams of experience and data and all sorts of other evidence that for many, that promise is not fulfilled in the same way that it is for others. So specifically in the book, I argue that this disconnect hinges on knowledge and on ways of being a specialized knower in the university. So what kinds of knowledge do students have access to? Who is this knowledge for? Who does it represent? Who created this knowledge? How are students able or encouraged to engage with and use this knowledge? And how is knowledge conceived of in the first place as part of the social justice or emancipatory purposes of higher education, to paraphrase Luca Mavelli. So to address this disconnect and hopefully to reconnect the social and the individual in ways that do enable wider success as a result of wider and more equitable participation, we need to be able to theorize the roles of knowledge and the work of those who work with knowledge, the knowers, in ways that address individual and social dimensions of creating, sharing, debating, and challenging knowledge, and that address multiple forms of being a specialized knower in different disciplines, contexts, and fields of study and practice. And this is where I think legitimation code theory can help us, and why I've chosen so far to use these tools in doing my own academic development work and in my own work as a lecturer as well. So, LCT. I'm going to introduce it for those of you, obviously, who are new to it in the room today. And I'm going to read from and paraphrase parts of my book here. And I hope you'll indulge me in doing that because the introduction I wrote there is a pretty good one. And it's quite hard to rewrite this introduction over and over again. So LCT, as it is known, Legitimation Code Theory, is a sociological framework that is influential in educational and social research and practice around the world at the moment. Carl Mayton began developing LCT during his own doctoral work in the late 1990s. And he began by incorporating, connecting and building on ideas from principally the work of Pierre Bourdieu on field theory and Basil Bernstein, particularly on his educational knowledge codes and pedagogic device. And there's also some influence uh, around, from Karl Popper um, on Popper's ideas around knowledge, I believe. I haven't actually read Karl Popper's work myself. <laughs> so the framework is also influenced, in addition to all of this, by critical and social realist understandings on knowledge. So this means that LCT understands knowledge, to quote Mayton, as an object of study, that while socially created and used, is also real, in that it has properties, powers, and tendencies. So while knowledge is created by actors, by you and me, living and working within specific social and historical contexts, what this means is that it can't be reduced to those contexts or to the motivations and beliefs of those actors. It can't be, knowledge can't be conflated with the knowers who created it. What the knowers have given rise to now has its own reality in the sense that it has effects. So we can create and shape knowledge and context, and then we can also be shaped um, and influenced by those, by that knowledge and by those contexts in turn. It's a sort of dialectic relationship. Much educational research in the past four or five decades has focused a lot on the knowers, students especially. How can teaching become more student-centered? How can we become more responsive to students' learning needs and goals? Um, 
There's a lot of research on student engagement. There's a lot of research on authentic learning, on student-centered learning, on learning and teaching, on different forms of student-centered assessment and feedback. Just about every field um, in higher education has thought a lot about this. And some of the influential theories that have, that have been used here have emphasized, um, if you like, psychologized notions of learning and of knowledge. So out of that, I think you can kind of see the emergence of research on motivation and on personal attributes of successful students. On, I think learning styles might fit in here somewhere. Um, different ways to get students to want to learn and to want to be successful. And I've certainly had a lot of conversations with lecturers over the years where one of the principal questions they ask me when I come in to help them with their teaching is, how do I get my students to want to learn? <laughs> and it's like, well, that's one of the questions that has sort of driven my research for the last 10 years, really. Um, so they, this, this, this theory, though, it can look a lot at the knowers and a lot at what the students are doing and what the teaching is doing. But it can't really look at the role that specialized knowledge plays in specializing these knowers. So not just how does a student become a successful graduate, how does a student become a successful engineer? How does a student become a successful medical doctor? And not just a medical doctor in general, different kinds of medical doctors. How does a student become a successful uh, classicist or philosopher or teacher or, I don't know, insert any number of different professions or, or um, disciplinary identities here? So what LCT has sought to reclaim is knowledge. What differentiates and specializes different forms and kinds of knowledge and what makes these different forms and kinds of knowledge powerful in specific contexts. So the university, but also professional practice, also civil society, um, also in, in communities and communal contexts. Um, LCT is used a lot in education, but a colleague of mine, Ian Sieberger, for example, uses it to look at how um, decisions get made in parliament. And uh, there's a woman in France who also looks at it, uses it to look at how um, the identity of Freemasons are created. What, what is the Freemason and how do practices around Freemasonry evolve? So it's not just used in education, it's used in other contexts as well. But this reclamation of knowledge and this view of knowledge is important for research and practice if we're talking about enabling greater participation wider epistemological access um, and through this greater success for more students. Because how LCT works is through getting at a more nuanced theorizing of knowledge and knowers in and across the disciplines. And it does this through characterizing what we do and how we do it and who we value in education as being shaped by different sets of organizing principles that lie underneath what we see and do and experience in our daily lives. And I'm going to get to some examples now, now. So if this feels like a lot, just please hang in there. So the framework as it stands now comprises three different dimensions called specialization, semantics, and autonomy. And each of these explores a different set of organizing principles that underlie practices, beliefs, and dispositions. They are useful, these tools, because they enable us to get at what lies beneath what we experience on the surface, for example, in a lecture or in an assessment cycle or in a curriculum or in a program, or as I said, in a parliamentary decision-making process or in a social organization. Analysis of these organizing principles is powerful, important, because it helps us reveal the rules of the game or what Maiden calls the ways of working, resources and forms of status within fields. So each set of organizing principles we conceptualize through a legitimation code. I'm going to talk today about specialization codes, but there are also semantic codes and autonomy codes. And basically what these codes capture is some form of the rules of the game. And often these rules of the game, while they are part of just about everything we say and do and learn and um, value, are not always overt and visible and tangible and talked about even with students or in, in lectures, tutorials, curriculum, documents, assessment. In, um, there's been quite a lot of research in academic literacy fields talks about this tacit knowledge and how a lot in a lot of instances students are kind of assumed to have Hannah Bock made this argument in 1988. She said, we never assume the students will come to grade one having grade one literacy. We assume that we will teach them primary literacy at primary school and we will teach them secondary literacies at secondary school. But for some weird reason, 
When students come to tertiary education, we assume that they have tertiary literacies in place before we've even taught them those literacies. So that's part of sort of the rules of the game that trips students up. We kind of assume that they know what the rules are and they know how to play this game. Otherwise, why would they be at university? And we don't often see how much of who we are and what we can do is shaped by those specialized ways of working and how we need to actually share that with our students rather than assume they can pick it up by some sort of magical osmosis um, or immersion. Now, I've spoken to a lot of lecturers about this over the last 12 years, and some of them have said to me, oh, but you know, that's spoon feeding my students. I mean, that's just making things too easy for them. Don't they have to work at this? I mean, I think that view is part of quite an exclusionary and unjust approach to education myself, but I'm gonna come back to that a little bit later. So the goal of the LCT framework as a whole is to offer us a way to see more effectively and theorize more effectively what we cannot see or theorize or think about with our common sense or everyday understandings. It's a specialized theoretical apparatus concerned with meaning making and knowledge building with different underpinning organizing principles or orientations to meaning and knowledge. And what's fantastic about the framework just on a, on a very practical level is that you can use each of these dimensions separately or you can combine them um, and you can use them to think about things like how do we teach abstracted concepts that don't have empirical references in the real world and if you're interested in that you can look at Margaret Blackie's research on teaching inorganic chemistry or how do we capture the ways in which musicians develop their knowledge and practice and aesthetic sense and share this with others and then you can look at Saul Richardson's work or Jody Martin's work on jazz education. Um, there's research that uses one dimension. So Margaret Blackie uses semantics in that paper. Saul Richardson uses specialization, which I'm going to talk about now. now. Um, or there are, in my own work, for example, in my PhD, I used a combination of specialization and semantics because the problem I was looking at required that. So it's a quite a versatile, quite a practical, quite a visual sort of tool. And I'm going to show you how that works now. So I'm gonna talk specifically about specialization today and particularly in relation to who and what we legitimate in our curricula. So specialization is the dimension of LCT that asks in its very simplest sense, what makes this discipline or this set of practices special? What is the basis for legitimate success and achievement in this context? And there are two concepts that we use to unpack the basis for legitimate achievement and to work out what it is that we're doing. So one enables us to look more closely at knowledge and the other enables us to look more closely at knowers. But in every set of practices, in every discipline, in every field of study all the time, there's always knowledge and there's always knowers. But in reality, these are so intertwined, it's quite hard to separate them. So with a little bit of underlaboring by critical realism, much in the same way that if any of you are familiar with Margaret Archer's work, she does this thing that she calls analytical dualism, where she pulls apart things that in reality are not all that separate, and she holds them analytically as separate, so that we can avoid conflating them and smushing everything together and then not being able to see what's actually going on. So this is kind of what LCT does here. It says there's always knowledge and there's always knowers, but we need to be able to see these two things slightly separately so that we don't avoid confusing one with the other. So specialization says, in any practice, there is knowledge, knowledge about something, and this can take different forms, principle, theoretical, practical, procedural, technical, maybe you can think of other forms of knowledge. Um, and there is also a knower who creates and learns and works with this knowledge. And this knower can also take different forms through adopting and developing different sets of dispositions, different attitudes and aptitudes in relation to knowledge. And we term the knowledgey stuff epistemic relations, and we term the knowery stuff, social relations. And we, we theorize these related knowledge and knower practices along continua of strengths and weaknesses. And I'm gonna show you the planes now now, but two examples to try and hopefully help this all make sense for the context. So if you think about physics or chemistry as a discipline, what is valued as the basis of achievement? What do you have to master to be a competent physicist or chemist so that you can graduate and get a job working in this field in some other way. Well, you need to master certain skills, right? 
So you need to know, for example, how titration works. You need to understand how to solve particular problems. You need to know particular kinds of equations. You need to know maybe about modeling, setting up and running different kinds of experiments, all of that kind of stuff. It's quite technical and it's quite procedural. And it also relies on particular forms of what you might call principled or theoretical knowledge as well. But to do all this work, ideally, you'd probably benefit from being quite methodical and logical. Um, a scientists often talk about how important it is to be skeptical and to be open to being wrong so that you don't think that everything you find out is right. A uh, hallmark of good scientists is they always assume that the knowledge they have is partial and they could be wrong. Um, so they're, they're curious and they're constantly asking questions. So this is a kind of disposition. If you look at, for example, Hanjiswa Konana's work where she talks about um, phys, phys, becoming a physicist um, these are some of the things that they talk about as being part of the disposition. So there's procedural and theoretical and technical knowledge, and there's a set of dispositions. There's knowledge and there's knowers, right? Both of those things. But what gets you the degree? What gets you the job in the lab? What you know, or how well you know it, or who you are? And if you're tempted to say, well, both, obviously, you're not completely off base, right? Because there is always knowledge, there is always knowers. But, and this is a very big but, it's very seldom the case that both are equally important and emphasized as the basis for legitimate success. One more example, politics. I myself have a degree in politics. So I have experience as being a politics student. Uh, I've taught politics and I've also, um, used politics as one of the case studies in my PhD research and in the book. So again, we can ask, well, what's the basis for successful achievement in this discipline? So there's knowledge, there's general knowledge, there's geographical knowledge. Um, I remember one of my lecturers making us fill in the world map because he said, you can't do politics if you don't know where the Middle East is, you have to know where everything is on the world map. And it turns out actually he was quite right about that. It's very valuable knowledge to have as a politics student. Um, there's a bit of ethics and philosophy. There's some sociology. All of this knowledge from these other disciplines is pulled into politics and turned towards the study of governments and states and the international political system and key political and social issues, right? So there's a lot of knowledge. But to harness and use this knowledge, you need to have a particular set of dispositions towards knowledge and towards the world around you. You need to be critical. You need to have an analytical mind. You need to be curious and skeptical. To be really good, you probably also have to think outside the box a bit. And that would take a particular form in this discipline. But again, we ask both knowledge and knowers, but what is the basis for legitimate achievement? So research, some of my own, but also other people's research into these two fields has shown that in the first case, it's the knowledge that is emphasized being technically competent, able to follow certain procedures, use theory in the form of, for example, um, equations, create hypotheses to solve, create and solve problems. And to do this very methodically and logically, that is what tends to mark out a successful scientist. Being curious and skeptical and so on is part of this. But if you are curious and you can't do the science, you can't be a scientist, right? So the basis for success is stronger epistemic relations and weaker social relations. So not no social relations, weaker relative to the epistemic relations, which makes this a knowledge code in terms of the specialization plane, which you can see on the, what is this, my left hand, sorry, slightly dyslexic, my left hand. So in politics, you need to use knowledge of the world around you. So you have to have descriptive as well as theoretical knowledge. You need to make and defend arguments. You need to address social and political issues to become more critical, to become more analytical, to become more questioning. But if you can sort of spout lots of abstract theory about democracy and the state and what is a government and what is power, and if you can tell me everything you can remember about the history of governance in South America and Europe, but you can't actually make an argument, you can't defend that argument, you can't put the knowledge to work to find creative ways to analyze and explore social and political problems, you're not really going to be successful political scientist. So what is valued here is actually the dispositions. So this represents weaker epistemic relations relative to stronger social relations, and this would be called a NOAA code. 
So you can see on the right hand side, this is from um, the second chapter of the book, there's been all this other research that's been done that's shown empirically, for example, that mechatronics is quite a strong knowledge code, that physics is a knowledge code, that law also can behave as a knowledge code, that um, jazz studies, English studies are knower codes. There's a lot more other research out there. I had limited space. <laughs> but there are also two other codes which you can see on the specialization plane, the elite codes on the top right and the relativist codes on the bottom left. Uh, research has shown, for example, Alexandra Lamont's research has shown that school music, GC GCSE level music, can behave as what is called an elite code where you actually need at the same time technical skill and creativity and aesthetic sense to be really successful. Fine art, for example, might be another one that ends up being a, an elite code. A relativist code, there are not that many of them in research, but I suppose from my own experience, having taught in one of these um, courses, it might be represented by something like a disembedded academic literacy or academic writing module where you use very generic materials. For example, I remember the one time we got our students to write an essay on wind farms, um, which wasn't anything to do with anything they were studying in any of their disciplines, um, but we just used that as material. And we had quite a, almost like a formulaic approach to writing essays, which worked for some of the disciplines they were going into, but didn't work for others. I mean, they, they, they were just, horrible at philosophy based on what we taught them because philosophy was just a whole other way of thinking and writing. So I think for students that must that might have felt like a relativist code, like there is no specialized anything here. This is just learning how to write essays with random stuff that you guys have found on the internet. So um, that's really more anecdotal than empirical though. <laughs> So what's useful about these planes, these Cartesian planes that LCT uses to plot these different um, combinations, these different organizing principles, sets of organizing principles, is that it can capture movement. I'm gonna show you one more example from research, which I think is immensely powerful and I refer to it a lot. This is Dion Stain's work. Dion Stain did this work at Cape Peninsula University of Technology for her PhD in 2012. And this is based on a presentation she did in 2014. So, some background, and I think um, this might be familiar to some of the people in, in the room from their own teaching context, it's certainly familiar from my own teaching context. So what happened was this was a um, three year undergraduate design program. And this research was done in the first year of the program. So these were students who were doing sort of general design, and then were going to specialize in textile design, jewelry design, um, graphic design, um, interior design, so other kinds of design disciplines. And um, as you may expect, uh, a lot of the assessments in the first year were around things like you got to learn the color wheel and what's a contrasting and a complementary color. And we learn about contrast, shadows and light. And we learn about um, all these different kinds of like principles of design. So um, there was quite a lot of technical and procedural knowledge in the curriculum. But then on top of this, there were also some assignments that um, asked students to take some risks and to be a bit adventurous and to show their creativity. Now, she introduced semantics, which I haven't talked about, but the SG, the design situation context column here, that SG stands for semantic gravity. And that really just is about the context dependence. So is it really abstracted and generalized and you can't really figure out a context that it applies to? Is it somewhere in the middle of that? So it's semi-authentic, but it's not actually a real world situation or is it like really out there in the real world? Like you actually have to go and design something for somebody who's a real client, almost um, a different form of work integrated learning. So in addition to these different combinations of, is this more technical and procedural? Is this more creative? There was also, is this more abstracted from a real design context or is it closer to a real design context in terms of um, what kind of task it is? And what she found when she used the, so what was happening was there were all these different assignment tasks, small ones, large ones across the first year. And it was a bit of a mishmash. Uh, students, the success rates were low Students were really struggling. There was a lot of complaints about how hard the module was and that none of them could really figure out what was going on. They couldn't quite figure out why the students weren't doing so well and why their feedback was missing the mark and why they were frustrated. The students were frustrated. Everybody was a bit cross. 
So Dion came at this and she thought, well, maybe what I could do is use some LCT here to try and sort of see what's underneath all of this. And what she discovered when she coded the assignments was that um, there were different kinds of design knowledge areas that they were looking at. There were different kinds of design situations or contexts, and there were different aspects of process. And these corresponded to kinds of levels of designer from novice all the way to master. And when she coded the curriculum, what she found was that in the first semester, students had a novice task, an expert task, a competent task, and an advanced beginner task, all next to each other, all in a kind of not in a sequential order. So students were trying to, for example, in some of the novice tasks, they were trying to sort of learn um, the knowledge and use the technical techniques and procedures and they were succeeding, but then they tried to use that exact same approach to do a task that was designed for maybe a competent designer, which definitely had a lot more of the social relations emphasized and they weren't getting it because the lecturers were saying, no, 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 we wanted you to be creative here. We didn't want you to just follow the rules. We wanted you to break the rules. And students were like, what do you mean? I don't even know what the rules are yet. So there was a lot going on there. And what Dion found was that they actually were doing what's called an LCT, a code shift. So they were starting with a knowledge code in first year. Lots of like, what are the techniques of design? What are the principles of design? What are the kinds of rules we follow as designers to create beautiful spaces or to create beautiful jewelry or to create beautiful artworks? How do we do that? What are some of the things, the tools and the tricks and the, and the knowledge that we use? And then they were slowly wanting to build students towards now, how do you take these on board and then mix them up? and adapt them and find different ideas and take different risks and create new ways of designing a room or making jewelry or creating textiles or whatever the case is. But what actually happened was this was sort of all over the place. It wasn't a smooth sort of aggregative or, or cumulative sense of a code shift from more abstract to general simpler tasks. So the, the SD line here is really about complexity minus is simpler tasks plus is more complex tasks so what they wanted was they wanted students to move from simple not very applied tasks so quite sort of abstract tasks like draw a head that's got light and dark shadows in it or use the color wheel and um, select complementary and contrasting colors to complete this picture you know those kinds of tasks and then they wanted students to slowly 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 begin to apply their technical and procedural knowledge to address more complex, more situated tasks. So here's a room. The client wants you to design this room and has given you the brief that it must be warm, happy, and light. Off you go. So what they would then have to do is draw on lots of different kinds of knowledge. So it was a complex task and it was a very situated task. It was a real room that they had to come up with a real design plan for. So what they, sh what she was able to show them was not only the shifts that they were making in complexity and in abstraction, she was also able to show them that they were shifting from a knowledge code towards a knower code and maybe even towards an elite code where actually successful designers have both as the basis for legitimate achievement, both a good grasp on the technical and procedural or principle design knowledge and on the creativity, adventurousness, risk-taking, trying new things. And so this was an immensely powerful tool for doing this kind of work, which brings me to my last few slides, which are, okay, so now this is all awesome. But what does this mean for social justice and for access and for success and for how we create more socially just teaching environments and opportunities for students? And I think there are three implications, really. So the first is that it takes something that is often quite tacit and applied, these rules of the game, and it makes them visible and it makes them explicit. So instead of leaving students to read between the lines and work out what it is that we want from them, we can actually say, this is what we want. This is why we want this. And this is how you can adjust or adapt what you're doing to meet these expectations. So why is it more legitimate to have this knowledge than other knowledge? Why is this the way we do things and not some other way? Why are these the procedures and not those, right? 
because, and I thought of an example from my writing course recently, because a student asked me, why do scientists always want to write in the third person? It's like so arbitrary. And I think the students saw it as arbitrary because they've just been told it like, this is just a rule. This is just how we write. In science, we just, we never say I, we always just say, you know, passive voice, third person, it, you know, it did this, um, not I did this. And um, he said, well, you know, I've also seen some papers where they do say I and we. And so we unpacked where the I and we's were and where they weren't. And we were able to actually have a conversation about how this isn't linked to some kind of arbitrary rule that somebody came up with 100 years ago and we used to just all do it because it's the way it's done. It has to do with the knowledge and the values of science. So science values objectivity. They value replicability. They value reliable, valid, trustworthy data. Now, if you introduce a fallible human into that, and this is how a scientist I work, have worked with explained it to me, he said, if you introduce fallible humans into this and you make them too visible, then it makes people nervous because then they start thinking, well, maybe somebody did something wrong with the pipette or I don't know, maybe somebody put the wrong number into the computer. And then how do we know that these very common, very topical issue at the moment, how do we know these vaccines are safe, you know? big farmers involved and the scientists rushed the, the trials and, and I'm not getting a vaccine, it's going to be very unsafe. So if we want people, this is what he said to me, if we want people to trust science, we need to make it about the science, not about the people. It's not about me. It's, I, it doesn't matter who I am. What matters is, did I do the science right? And so if I foreground the science and I do that using the third person and I take myself out of it, then I think my science is more trustworthy and it's more sort of evident that it's not about me, it's about the science. So that's generally why they would like to write in the third person, according to the scientists I've talked to. Now, LCT actually helped us to have this conversation because I said to him, well, talk to me about some of the writing your students are doing because they're really struggling. And through kind of thinking about, well, you know, if this is a knowledge code, then it influences like the values. What are the values you have related to the knowledge? And then how does that influence who your students have to be as knowers and how they show you that? We then got to this conversation and then he was able to actually start having different kinds of conversations with his students about what they needed to do and how they needed to do it and why those practices were valued or legitimated. So coming back to that comment I made earlier about spoon feeding, is explaining the value of writing in the third person spoon feeding students? Or is it taking the rules of the game and the base, part of the basis for success and making it visible to students and saying, here, this is how we do what we do. This is why we do it. This is how you can start doing it. So that instead of seeing, especially this um, pertains to writing, is rather than seeing all the things around referencing and style conventions as random and arbitrary, they actually start connecting them to the knowledge and to the ways they're being specialized into being particular kinds of knowers and holding particular kinds of sets of dispositions and values in relation to that knowledge. So, you know, I don't think it's spoon feeding. I think it's good teaching. Um, you know, what we reward, and I'm a bit nervous because he's in the room, but what I've taken away from some of Paul Ashwin's work is that what we reward is not so much hard work, actually. It's, it's the possession of different kinds of social symbolic capitals. Um, and they masquerade as hard work. So students who can work out um, how to write in the required ways get rewarded. And lecturers then say, oh, well, you know, they're working very hard and they're motivated. And then the students who are not writing in the required ways need to try harder. They need to work harder. But what's actually being rewarded isn't my hard work. It's the fact that I went to a middle class school and that I had educated parents who read stories to me and I had access to libraries from when I was two years old. And it, that's given me a particular set of um, dispositions already that are quite, as Sue McKenna says, congruent with the ways of doing things at university. So that's what's being rewarded. Um, I'm quite sure now, having worked with hundreds of students over the years, that some of the hardest working students that I worked with were the students who were struggling the hardest to succeed rather than the other way around. So the second implication then, I think, is that we can actually now start asking some harder questions about the basis of achievement and how we make that visible. So we can actually start to say to ourselves, 
what are we legitimating and whom are we legitimating? And when we start asking these questions, we can potentially stop just reproducing existing or historical practices without being able to really see these or critique these effectively. So if I'm a politics lecturer, I'm working in a NOAA code, I figured that out. I can now say to myself, well, what kind of NOAA then is being legitimated? Do I have some kind of like tacit ideal graduate in my head and I'm trying to make my students into this graduate? And then very crucially, who is silenced by this ideal that I have in my head? Who is not represented by this ideal that I have in my head? And what might that do to the students in my classroom and to their goals and desires and dreams and why they're here at university trying to get a degree? And then to push it further, if we ask about the knowledges. So if we're centering in our curriculum, Western knowledges, the global North or the West as the point of comparison. And we're then measuring all the other countries and systems and different kinds of social problems against what's happening in the global North and the West. What does that then say to students about the kinds of dispositions we want them to take on and the kinds of knowers we want them to be? And by contrast, if we decenter the West, if we decenter the global North, and if we actually introduce indigenous knowledges, African knowledges, uh, feminist perspectives, um, different ways of, of thinking about knowledge, different ways, different sites of knowledge production. And we don't just introduce them, we also center them and legitimate them through the teaching, through the curriculum, through the assessment that we ask students to complete. What does that then say about the kinds of knowers we want our students to be and the kinds of dispositions we want them to take on? So we can start asking ourselves some very practical questions. Uh, on our own, but also in teams that we teach with in our departments across the universities, across departments. How can we write assessment tasks, create assessment criteria, offer students feedback that shows them the specialization code? But then more than that, how can we change or question or critique what we currently regard as the basis for legitimate success if that needs to be critiqued and changed? And how can we be then begin to do it? And so the third implication for me is that we can make students part of these conversations. One of the most fantastic things we've, we've learned about LCT over the last 10 years is that you can teach it to students without making it overly complex or difficult. You can explain to students in relatively simple terms that in everything we do, there's knowledge. It's quite a tangible thing. It's in their course notes, it's up on the slides in front of them. It's in the papers that they're reading. It's in what they're writing and, and producing. And there's knowers, look around you. We are all knowers. I'm a knower, you're a knower. The people whose work you're reading are knowers, right? So there are these two dimensions. But in some practices, we want one more than we want the other. And so in this discipline, what we really want is we want the knower stuff. So we don't want you to memorize all the stuff about the state and government. And that knowledge is useful, but it's useful because it's trying to help you become a particular kind of thinker. Right, So this is what it is that we're at after here. And I've had colleagues who've done this with their students and it has shifted the conversation in the classroom because students are then able to ask different kinds of questions and they're able to engage differently with you and with the materials. And you can also, for example, if you're not sure if you're getting through to your students, you can use specialization to have a different kind of conversation around evaluation. What do you think you need to do to be successful in this discipline or in this course? what like tell me in your own words like what do you think you are here for like what do you think I'm rewarding you for when I mark your assignments and if there's alignment yay <laughs> but if there isn't if students are saying I think I need to memorize all of the stuff and you're going oh no there's no memorizing here that's not what I'm valuing then you can start kind of working through them like why do you think that I had a lecturer I worked with in law who was so frustrated because his students kept memorizing lists of legal principles and then just giving her the legal principles in the test instead of using them to answer the questions. And when we went back and actually talked to the students about it, they said, but you keep putting up tables on the board. And so we're memorizing the tables because that's what we did at school. And so she learned quite an interesting lesson on how to present her what she was doing to the students so that there was greater alignment between her expectations and what they were actually doing. So we can make this a shared conversation we can unpack these things with our students and bring them in on it and make them part of it which i think is quite powerful so i'm nearly there last two slides so obviously there's more than one way to think about access and success 
um, and how to better enable this for students. There's a lot of people doing some very, very cool work in lots of different ways around the world and with different theories. LCT is one theoretical tool that can help us do this work and it's quite useful because it works well with other approaches such as academic literacy theory, feminist theory, social realist theory, and potentially also decolonial and Southern theory too. But the point of this work is not theory wars, right? This theory is better than that theory or this approach is the best approach and you shouldn't use the other approaches. It's about creating and sustaining more equitable, representative and just educational environments. And to do that, I think we need, and I'm going to quote one of my former therapists here, we need to be able to hold the ambivalence, right? This is a tricky, complex issue involving real people and real histories and real legacies. And it's you can't create a tick box and tick that box off and then say, right, great, you know, we've made the curriculum just, we've made the curriculum representative. I think this is an open-ended process and it's something that we're going to be working on for as long as we work in higher education. And I think in the world in general today, people are unable to do this. They, they want a box and they want things to fit in the box. And if things can't fit in the box that they're invested in, then it's a bad thing and it must just go away. And we see this a lot in, in politics, but we see it all over society as well. And I think that we have to really try very hard to resist that in higher education, as hard as that is, um, that sort of binary thinking, like this is deep learning, this is surface learning, this is a high road transfer, this is low road transfer, this is engaged, this is disengaged, this is active, this is passive. Those binaries are not useless, they're starting points for thinking, but we have to be able to work beyond those to kind of say, well, can these things be both? Can this be a both and? And then in what ways is it a both and and how does that influence my teaching? So I think that what's valuable in using critical social theory and, and LCT has certainly shown itself to be useful in this way is that it can create a shared language with which we can lift ourselves up out of our own personal experiences, our local context, our partial knowledges, and speak across different kinds of contexts, different kinds of problems, different kinds of disciplines, different ways of working with knowledge, different ways of being a knower. And critical social theory, in, an, in a broad manner, this is the work it does. It takes a relational view of the world and of being in the world. It supports nuanced thinking. It resists easy answers. And it can be shared with our students so that we're doing the work with our students, not for or to our students. So this kind of creativity and this kind of thinking is really valuable. And then I think ultimately in closing that creating socially just representative education is on all of us, not on individuals alone, but as part of systems with structures and cultures that need to be challenged that need to be questioned and that need to be expanded and made and remade and reimagined. But changes to established and often hard to see systems, cultures and structures that are powerful in shaping who we are, what we do and who we think our students are and who they should become are very hard to make. And I think, you know, really ultimately this is not just head work, it's also heart work. It's, it requires a lot of us because to make these changes in our teaching, to ask these kinds of hard questions, to learn to use this kind of theory and then to take us where the theory takes us in terms of forcing us to really think about what we're doing, we may have to change ourselves in terms of reflecting on the assumptions that we're making and the ways in which we may be supporting unequal, racist, sexist, ableist, exclusive education that silences or marginalized students who need not just to be included, but to be represented in different kinds of curriculum teaching and assessment practices that speak not to the past, but to where we are now and where we want to go or need to go in the future. And I think this probably sounds quite idealistic. And generally speaking, I'm not an I'm, I'm more of a pessimist than an idealist. But when it comes to this, I think I am quite idealistic because I think we can do this. I don't think this is, as Jan says, utopian thinking. Um, I think we can do it with with collective work, with supportive leadership, which is a whole other thing, with robust means for theorizing the work that we're doing, the knowledge we're working with, what we're trying to accomplish in higher education, and with collegiality. And then I think also with a healthy dose of courage and of hope for a more socially just, representative, kinder university 
and by extension, hopefully a more socially just representative and kind of society. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sharon. That was um, that was really rich and and insightful. Um, uh, lot lots in there. Lots yes, of sorry. Lots <laughs> will, will ring true for people in many ways. Um, I see in the chat someone's had to leave, but said really interesting and thought provoking. Thank you so much. Fascinating, deeply insightful. And can you share a link for your book? So please feel sure. plug it in the chat. Um, if you'd like to, uh, but people could always uh, e email me or Sharon for, for details. So I'll open up for questions now. Um, and so you can either post it in the chat or, or speak and please feel free to uh, show yourself now if you'd like to. Oh, great. So yeah, share a link to my blog as well, really quickly, while people are... Oh, please do a link to the blog okay. because um, really people... I don't read many blogs, but but this this is a, this is not your average blog. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. Got a podcast coming too, so watch the space for details. Oh. <laughs> I may invite you to come on my podcast and talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so any questions? Uh, yep, JB, you want to ask a question? Hi, hi, Sharon. I'm particularly uh, interested in the in the topic today, um, and I'm I'm looking at the overall student experience at the moment. Um, um, thank you for the great uh, examples of uh, academic practices. I wanted to know because at at some point you mentioned uh, mixing the academic practices and social project. I guess you mean like extracurricular um, activities, right? Potentially, yes. <laughs> okay. 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 So I just wanted to know how you 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 mix and you link uh, oh. this academic experience with extracurricular uh, extracurricular activities or professional practices together uh, to improve the overall experience and to make it more socially just. Right. Okay. So that's a good so question. Last question. <laughs> no, no. Um. It's I'm I'm. I'm not doing this currently in my own practice, but I'm working with um, some colleagues in Sweden who are thinking of one version of this. And there's certainly, um, for example, Chris Winberg and James Garraway here in South Africa have been doing this at the Cape Peninsula University of Technology using some LCT in their design, mm -hmm. but around work integrated learning and work integrated practice. So um, I have a PhD student at the moment who's, who's researching um, accounting education using this framework. And she's particularly interested in questions of how do we connect the discipline with the world of practice so that students are able to actually see why the dispositions we try to train them in, in in university actually have meaning in the world outside. Because a lot of what the professions especially, I think, um, certainly my research in law, I found this, that a lot of what they expect students to take on at university is actually not a student-y kind of thing. It's a very professional kind of thing. Like when you're a lawyer, you must be like this. And first year students aren't lawyers yet. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're still just trying to figure out how university works. And so I think what's, um, what's really been interesting for the lecturers in using some of these tools with me and some staff development work is that they've kind of seen almost how they have unrealistic expectations for their students early on. And that also they're kind of assuming that their students will just like become professional. And, and they have one course in fourth year on preparing for legal practice. One course that actually overtly talks to them about professional legal behavior, but it's infused into everything they do. And I suppose in other um, courses that I've worked with in terms of like connecting the outside world and the, and the university world, I have one colleague, for example, who uh, does a first year politics course and she gets her students to sign up for a social movement and then write an assignment on why did I pick this social movement? Why do I think social movements are important? How might we understand the work of social movements using this theory that she teaches them? So there's so many different ways of doing this, but I think 
This is where people have, have used the other dimension I mentioned of LCT semantics, which really looks at the context dependence and independence of practices. And then the, um, what's the word? The uh, complexity of practices. And in professions, what we found is that what we're often working from is we're working a little bit like Dion Stein's wave. We're working from quite abstract, general, quite simple tasks, progressively towards more applied, more real, more authentic, more complex tasks. Um, and that's, uh, I don't know if that answers your question. I mean, it's a difficult one because certainly my colleagues in Sweden are battling with this at the moment um, because they're, they're, they're battling to sort of cross this bridge between um, what is sort of <laughs> authentic, you know, can you give students an imagined task that is authentic or does it have to be a real task? And I can't remember who said this, but they said whenever a student is at university, they're never practitioners. They're always practicing to be practitioners. It's always going to be one removed, one step removed. So, um, I mean, there are a lot of people thinking about this. I'm trying to help some of them, but um, it's early days. I don't know if that answers your question or if you want to ask it. Okay, no, thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I think LCT can be useful for asking questions about, about the kinds of practices and what that implies for what students need to do and know and how they then need to behave, I suppose, in terms of their assessments that they're doing and, and what they then will do with the knowledge that they've got access to. Hmm. I don't know. Gosh, it's, 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 so, it's so fascinating, isn't it? When you start to, to dig in. Yes, um, have any potentially. Other questions, please. Or comments or critique. That's <laughs> uh, someone there getting ready to ask. Ah, here we go. Kung Mi. Um, thank you so much. That was really good. Um, I really enjoyed it. I have two questions. Yes. Um, so the first question is, it's interesting that your presentation or your analysis is like really revolving around disciplinary differences. Mm. So I'm just wondering how big that is. I mean, like there is some general academic appetite that we have to, you know, um, but it's all about like how like law school should have their set of residency. And then that's different from educational uh, research kind of major students. Is it really, that's really important than just general things or how we are educated? So that's first question. And if I can, if I may squeeze another one or comments, it can be. I mean, personally, I, I like this idea of turning access to success and working with students a lot. Though, I think I have a little bit of ethical concerns that we seem to put a lot of like kind of pressure upon to certain students. You know, they have to do unpacking on top of everything that they have to learn the things, but we also want them to be part of this decolonizing process as activists. And then that's kind of, you know, so we kind of assume that they will be willing to do so or they're going to work with us. Uh, but like having said that, are we assuming that or are we, are we just putting additional pressure upon some students seemingly marginalized or underrepresented to do more work than? the people that's a really good point i'll come to that and the first question was about uh sort of genericism versus specificity broadly speaking right um and i i sort of i'm a strange sort of academic i think because i work in both spaces i teach um in two particular disciplines on a on an ad hoc basis but most of my work is actually like sitting at that level of I've got students in my courses from 20 different disciplines. And so it's quite difficult to just zoom in on one or another. So we work at this, the, you know, between these levels. Um, I sort of talk about this more, I think, in chapter two of the book, where I talk about employability skills and these discourses that have gripped us in universities at the moment. It's like, we have to make our students employable. And so we've got to teach them communication skills and we've got to teach them writing skills and we've got to teach them presentation skills and all of these different kinds of things. But I think research has more or less shown that what, and certainly I know this from having taught these different courses in science, in commerce and in humanities, that 
a skilled communicator, as if that's a graduate attribute of your university, uh, it's not the same thing if you're an engineer talking to a client, then you are like a lawyer defending a case in court, then you are a doctor talking to a terrified child who has to have surgery. You know, there are some things that may be general to that, but even if you talk about something like empathy, um, is empathy the same thing everywhere you find it? Is it the same for a social worker as it is for a doctor, as it is for a counseling psychologist, as it is for an academic developer working with a staff member who doesn't really want to change their course? Or, you know, I, um, these are the kinds of questions that I've, I've sort of started asking myself as well, because I do think that there are some things that are general um, in terms of, for example, uh, integrity and ethical behavior. And there are some general principles there that we all have to learn and we all have to kind of get on board with. Um, but then I think, then this is certainly research that's been done around graduate attributes. So these sort of general statements, most universities have them, a graduate of the University of X will have these kinds of attributes and characteristics. And what certainly we started doing at, um, at the university I used to work at in South Africa was each faculty then took the general statement and they said, what does this look like for a law graduate? What does this look like for a natural sciences graduate? What does this look like for an applied health sciences graduate? So when we say skilled communicator, what does that mean for a physiotherapist? What does that mean for an occupational therapist? And they started actually giving specificity to those. So they were still working with the general but they were saying, actually, it's not exactly the same for a physiotherapist than it is for a you know, natural medicine practitioner. There are some differences. And those differences really using LCT has helped me to see often have to do with hidden values that really are related to knowledge and being a particular kind of knower and working in a particular kind of context with particular kinds of problems. Um, so, I mean, I don't disagree that they are general. I don't, I don't like the word generic. I think they are generalized principles and things, but I do think that those need to be quite carefully worked with so that we don't end up trying to fit into like a one size. It's, you know, that's the problem with best practice. Best for whom? So in the book, I actually talk about better practice rather than best practice so that we can get away from these, like this is the best way to do things. It might be the best way for maths and science, but it might not be very good for the philosophers and the classicists because they might have different things going on. Um, which is, I think, why focusing on knowledge is so powerful because it really does discipline us. The disciplines discipline us as much as we work to create and change them. And then your second question oh, is such a good one. I had a conversation with a colleague at Nelson Mandela University, his name is Sabo Heleta. If you want to look at his work, it's fantastic. He does a lot of work on student activism, especially around fees must fall and around sort of transformation, decolonization. And I think he's grappling with these kinds of issues too, because often what happens, and we see it, just spend any time on social media, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and you'll see this. Um, you'll see people in privileged positions asking people who are in underrepresented, marginalized positions to do the work of helping the privileged figure out how to be better. So we do that a lot, right? So we'll say to Black people, oh, can you help me figure out how to become anti-racist? What should I read? What should I think about? And Black people are kind of like, dude, go do the work. That's, you know, there's lots out there you can go and read. Go Google it. Spend some time on Wikipedia. Like, why must I help you figure out how to change the situation that you or your ancestors created to benefit you? And I do think that there are serious ethical concerns with assuming that students are all, especially, for example, okay, I'm going to talk about my context because I know it the best, but um, uh, that, that Black students who are are part of or are peripheral to the fees must fall or roads must fall or decolonization movement want to actually be part of helping us solve the problem. I don't know that they do. I mean, I do think Savo is very clear, like he will not publish anything about student activists unless the student activists are part of that writing project, even if they just sort of read drafts and give him feedback, because he doesn't want to represent their voices to them, he wants them to represent their voice. He wants their voices to be part of his work. And I have a PhD student at the moment who wants to archive the voices of women activists in the fees must fall struggle. And she's grappling with these ethical issues at the moment too, because she's like, well, what if these women don't 
or want to be part of this project? Am I just assuming that because they're protesting, they're automatically activists, and if they're automatically activists, they automatically must be part of helping us find solutions? I think there's quite a lot of ambivalence there. And I think we have to be very careful not to, um, what do they say? The road to hell is paved with good intentions. And I think we have to be very careful about our intentions, especially those of us who are coming from the represented, not marginalized, privileged, powerful positions. Um, certainly in South Africa, there's a sense at the moment that um, it's time for those in privileged positions to be quiet and to listen to the people who have been marginalized and silenced for a long time. And we're kind of in this tricky ambivalent space at the moment where we want solutions, but it's too soon for solutions, I think. I think there needs to be more time to think and listen and hear some hard truths and sit with them and figure out what they mean rather than sort of trying to create a five steps to decolonize your curriculum, tick, 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 tick. <laughs> so I don't know if that responds to your comment though. Yeah. Thank you, that's very helpful. I okay. agree. So much work to do. That's really <laughs> interesting. And uh, we, we haven't got much time, but I, I know both Anne-Marie and myself in the chat have, first of all, I picked up, I like this idea of, to the extent that we have to talk about them at all, but talking about general attributes rather than generic. Generic is a horrible mm. word. Oh, and what, it's, what it says about the disciplinary richness of higher education is awful. And Anne-Marie has, 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 has expanded that to sort of say that um, best, she really agrees with the problem about the term best practice. Mm -hmm. Context is vital, our own, our students, our discipline, our institution, our department, you know, there's many layers there. Yes. I don't know if Anne-Marie, you want to add something to that or Sharon, you'd like to respond? We've well, got, let's see if maybe Anne-Marie wants to add something we've got first. about four minutes left. Yeah, I, I'm happy to. Unfortunately, I haven't got a video, so um, I, I have the privilege of being able to see you, Sharon, but I'm sure <laughs> three can't see me. And um, okay. I, I really, you know, I, I'm often championing um, a critique of this notion of best practice. It's very much just something people say without even thinking about. And, and, I, and I think it is something we do need to challenge because the context is vital in terms of what we're thinking about. And I think it's also the complexity as you've highlighted and, and sadly I didn't hear the full presentation. So we'll certainly be listening to the first part because your presentation sparked up lots of ideas for me. Um, but I think it's that, that connection that actually each of our students and, and groups of students will be bringing different things to the to the table and some Very of the ways so. in which we need to make things explicit for them um, will also need to be different and mm. and your point about us needing to listen so we mm. need to listen to our students uh, um, and, and our colleagues in terms of thinking about what it is they they are not listening and not just to the words but listening to the actions and the physical appearance when you can see them <laughs> uh, right. of, of actually what they yes. what is being said um so you know we can listen to the fact that many of our students in this past year in some departments and things haven't wanted to turn on a camera right. you know actually what does that tell us um about all sorts of things and 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 why might we want to make that explicit for why it's needed and what's you know what what's important and things so uh, i wasn't planning necessarily on saying too much but i'll, I'll pause there as, as colleagues know i can verbal so i'll pause. <laughs> thank you <laughs> so thank much Henry. i actually should say um because in a talk like this it's very hard to do all the referencing that you do in a written test but i got this idea of better practice and challenging based practice from my colleague cecilia jacobs who spoke about it in a keynote at Haltasa, which is actually on youtube um uh, if you're interested, you can email me and I'll send you the link. I, I can't find it now. It'll take me too long. But um, what's so um, what's what's so problematic about best practice for me is also this idea of boxes again. It's like, well, we put our practice in this box and this is the box that we do our practice from. And then something else comes along that challenges the box. And they're like, well, either you can't deal with it or the wheels fall off or you go, no, 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 get in the box, fit in the box. And 
Um, for example, Sarah Howard, who did research on the take up of um, educational technologies in New South Wales for school teachers, found that some of the school teachers loved the technologies. Amazing, couldn't get enough of them. And other school teachers were like, Ugh, I'm not using this. this, doesn't make any sense to me. I don't know, I don't even know why you're forcing me to do this. And what happened, because there was this notion of like educational technology is best practice, was that the teachers who didn't want to adopt it were the troublemakers and the teachers who want to adopt it were the champions. And what the, she actually yeah. found when she brought LCT to bear on it was she said, well, the disciplines that are adopting it, this makes sense for them with the knowledge yeah. stuff that's going on and what they value and how they work. And the disciplines that aren't adopting it, the subjects that aren't adopting it, it doesn't make sense to them because it doesn't fit with what it is that they're trying to do with the learning and teaching. They're not troublemakers. They're actually just working within a different mindset. So then there was this conversation about what would be better practice in these different subject areas and how might we create that collectively rather than just swooping in with the solution to all the problems. That's really not a solution to most people's problems at all, right? Uh, um, yeah, yeah. Could, couldn't, couldn't agree more. And I think actually for me, part of the motivation is, is thinking about some of the um, principles I would associate with inclusive practice in terms of mm. the flexibility to the situation, mm. the collaboration with part uh, with students and other stakeholders in terms of the developing what those solutions and things might be but uh, yeah. I will be in touch good yes please I put my email address in the chat if you do want to get hold of me and it's on my first slide as well when you come back to the video later well well that's fantastic and um I see also there's a comment from a colleague at Edge Hill which is a university very close to us Sharon, oh. sadly, some of her colleagues couldn't make it, but they'll, oh. they'll be looking for the book and, and, and there's also the video as yeah. well. So, but I just um, thank, thank Sharon for a really fascinating and, and really nicely explained, um, you know, it's, it's wonderful when someone has complex material and they can just share it with, with those of us who, who perhaps were a bit clueless about, about these things. So I found it really engaging and um uh, incorporated us all very much as an audience so thank you very much for that Sharon and I you. think you've now got uh, more people to read your book um, Yay. <laughs> and uh, perhaps we'll have further discussions in the future thank you to everyone Good. for attending and for your very thoughtful con contributions um, also thanks to Dee, Kungmi and Rebecca who do all the organization uh, that makes it all run smoothly and just in terms of the next EdRes seminar is on the 12th of May and it's presented by Jan MacArthur, who that's me, <laughs> and Joanne Wood, um, who's, we're both from Lancaster. And the title is Towards Wicked Marking Criteria, The Deceptive Allure of Clarity. And I think, I hope it will be quite a nice follow on from this because it's very much about what do we do with knowing that knowledge is complex, but then we have these ideas of best practice for assessment mm -hmm. and how the two collide so please join us if you can everyone you'd be very welcome and thank you again to Sharon thank you so much for having me and thank you all for being here it was a pleasure it was a thrill thank you I'm okay. grateful to have had the opportunity bye-bye everyone bye-bye everyone